a pretty good winter except for that one weekend that was a little iffy. Um, my name's Ron Saro. I'm the new president of the Linfield Historical Society. I want to thank everybody for coming out, supporting Linfield Historical Society. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, I just want to remind everyone to sign up for the free raffle. Give us, um, if you'd like to join us, uh, you can sign up tonight. You can join the Historical Society tonight, or you can just put your, um, give us your, our email, your email address, and we'll send you the email so you get the announcements. Okay, after tonight's presentation, we'll have some refreshments and we'll have some Irish music, so this is a good time. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, you should like and follow us on Facebook, that would help. Okay, so tonight we're not just coming out for a history lecture, we're building community. Um, the point is to bring together good food, drink, music, warmth, and good company. Conviviality, that's what the Irish call good crack. <laughs> we've, we've even got some mini pints of, we have some mini pints of non-alcoholic Guinness so you can get that awful taste in your mouth. Well, it's just like a real Irish pub. Okay, it's not my favorite. Tonight's speaker is Helen Breen, who will be speaking on the topic of the Boston Irish. Helen's a Linfield resident and former English teacher who has written extensively in local publications about the history of Linfield and Essex County. She will trace the challenges faced by the Irish arriving in Boston at the time of the potato famine through their political ascendancy in the 20th century. Helen's an elected member of the Massachusetts Historical Society and the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. Please welcome tonight's speaker, Helen Breed. I just want to say what a wonderful job Ron is doing as our, as our president. Um, I'm telling the story that I, of the Boston Irish as I've learned, but I think I need a little more light here. You need more light? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, so I can see. Um, tell the story of, from my perspective uh, of the Boston Irish. Now you see, I, next we have a picture of my mother. <laughs> and when I look in the mirror, I look more like my mother. Have you had that experience? You, mirror, you think you look more like your mother. Uh, I grew up with this story, this legend, this mystique of the Irish Catholics who came to Boston and all their woes, which the Irish did not want to give up. They never wanted to forget it. And my mother was, was one of those people who uh, told these stories with a lot of the longing and the uh, conditions in Ireland and the fact that they, they would never return because in those days when you came here it was rather uh, permanent. She was born in 1899. Um, when I, so it was a long time ago. She's been dead uh, quite a few years. That's her brother there, John Boland. I have some of my Boland cousins here tonight, I'm glad to say, uh, who unfortunately died in the Spanish flu, which was uh, a, tra you know, a terrible. Uh, situation and she often spoke of her brother. And then uh, we have let's see, next book. Okay. That is my you know, grand great grandfather, whatever it is, <laughs> Michael. Pa Bowen. She always referred to him as Pa Bowen. That's her father. Can everyone hear me back there? No. 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 Oh, wait. Can you be close to the microphone or I'll turn it up a little okay. bit. Okay. All right. Is that better? Just remind me if I uh, drift off, okay? But we're being Facebook Live, so we, uh, I'll be in the same position. Now, Pa Boland came over here around 1889 uh, from Ireland. He won his passage shearing sheep. He won gold coins. He came here. They, he did fairly well. Uh, but again, there was the saga of them never going back. And he, when he was dying, he thought he was under the Hawthorne tree in the fields of Ross Common. And uh, I was able to go many years later and see that beautiful community. Then we have the, this is my father, uh, when he was a young man, obviously, very young. <laughs> and his name was Frank Gallagher. Now the Gallaghers were here for a long time. And my mother would say when she would question them about the family history, they didn't seem to know or care. That they were very proud to be Irish, but they weren't, that interested in the history of the old country because they'd been here many generations. His great-grandfather, William Murray, uh, owned property in West Lynn, um, down near Sacred Heart Church. He had, and then he, he had a farm, and he also did shoemaking on the side. 
but he had seven children who had seven children. So I, that discouraged me from figuring out the genealogy, but my father often said he was related to everyone in West Lynn. And, and so that's, that's, we have a picture. Now this uh, makes me sad when I see this picture. My father, of course, is in the middle. He was the second youngest. These are the Gallagher children. This was taken in 1906. Now their mother had just died uh, of what they call then consumption of tuberculosis. She was a beautiful woman. And it really was uh, a terrible event, which was unfortunately not uncommon in those days. And sometimes if uh, Papa Gallagher had a few beers or was playing the numbers and I would become a little bit uh, distressed, my mother would always say, remember Helen, his mother died when he was six years old. So it, it, was, it was a sad story. Uh, their great grandfather, uh, William Murray was one of the founders of uh, Sacred Heart Church, uh, excuse me, of St. Mary's Church. How many know this church in Lynn? Anybody, anyone from Lynn, you know the area? And um, William Murray, about eight, uh, 1858, um, with others, of course, built the first Sacred Heart Church, and there it is. That is the grammar school to the uh, right, and that is now a um, place for senior living. So let us begin. After again, my story is really the Lynn Irish, but don't you think it's close enough to Boston? So, <laughs> but I'm telling you, I don't want to offend anyone because uh, this is the story of the Catholic Irish. But of course, we we still love our Yankee cousins. <laughs> so, socially, culturally, and politically, the Boston Irish have long been one of the most recognized groups on the American scene stereotyped in the media, courted in elections, and honored on St. Patrick's Day. Most histories of the Irish experience in this country devote at least one chapter to the Boston Irish. The rigid community upon which they descended, the overwhelming prejudice that they faced, and the endurance that made this, this hardy band survive and eventually dominate the city's life, at least politically, have set the Boston breed apart from their countrymen who settled in more diverse and receptive areas of the United States. Stripped of their land and culture for centuries by the hated British rule, the migrating Irish peasant was ill-prepared for urban living. Because of the restrictions of the penal code in Ireland, he was usually unschooled. His Catholic religion, the only source of his comfort in life, and the badge of his identity would be hated in the New World as it had been in Ireland by the Protestant ascendancies whose yoke he, they were trying to escape. But the litany of Irish woes from the curse of Cromwell to the disposition of their lands was only the prologue to the tragic uh, drama of the famine which scourged Ireland from 1846 to uh, 1851. Because the cereal crops and livestock were needed to raise rent money, the Irishmen depended almost entirely upon the potato for subsidence. The blight on this tumor spelled disaster for the peasant and his family. The tale of suffering, the lingering starvation, and the dehumanization of the uh, lands that resulted from this calamity will be told elsewhere. Immigration for one fourth of the uh, population resulted. Then we have now. How many recognize Stephen Pulio? Okay, this uh, Alan. No, what, what do you know about him? Uh, right, he did. He wrote the, the that famous story of the molasses flood. How many are familiar with the book? And many of us were at his presentation. Do you remember a couple of years ago? He, he was fabulous. This is one of his many books. And in this book, he describes, uh, it, it's described how he was one of the first philanthropists in the American experience. He brought food and materials to the uh, starving Irish. So we do want to remember our Yankee cousins and not, not overlook them. That is Robert Bennett Forbes. So of course, he was a, a Brahmin uh, par excellence. Then, uh, the next, the Kunit line. The selection of Boston as the port that would receive the British mail en route to Canada was an accidental factor 
that determined the arrival of so many Irish in the hub. The Cunard carriers had the cheapest fares to America. Approximately 30,000 Irishmen resided in Boston in 1844. That's just before the famine. The number increased to 70,000 by 1853. Boston in the first half of the 19th century was the most Anglophile city in America, led by a cast of Brahmin elite, manned by powerful trade and artisan groups who succeeded with Yankee ingenuity and served by an undercrust of rabble-rousing intolerant ruffians who indulged in anti-papist pranks. Boston was the least likely uh, host for the tattered Irish immigrants. And because it, the boats carried the mail uh, to, from Cork to uh, Boston, that's why there was so much availability for this uh, steerage, for the steerage passenger. Then we go on to the uh, Charlestown fire, the Convent fire. Now this happened in 1834, but the way my mother told it, I thought it was happened at least in the 1920s, but did not. Long before the famine, an ugly incident had occasion, uh, occurred that had dramatically illustrated the atmosphere of hatred, prejudice, and suspicion awaiting the Irish Catholic in the community. The burning of the Ursuline Convent in Charlestown, Massachusetts on August 11, 1834, the very presence of the nuns and the existence of a nunnery furiously excited the working class neighborhood in which it stood. The story of the sister who had uh, left the convent to seek help elsewhere fueled the imagination of the curious onlookers who were convinced that the convent was a medieval institution of orgies and uh, torture. Ironically, the majority of girls at the school were upper-class Protestants. Their parents appreciated the superiority of the European education offered by the nuns. The mother superior, sensing the fury, allowed the selectmen to inspect the entire premises. Their conclusion that nothing was awry did not convince the spectators. Nothing would satisfy them until the hated structure was destroyed. Um, giving ample warning that allowed the nuns and the children to flee, the mob ruthlessly attacked the property, even desecrating the communion host. Now this incident just, again, uh, was part of the legacy of uh, the Irish. They, they never wanted to forget it. And trust me, they, they did not. <laughs> the respectable elements of Boston society were shocked at the lawless deed on the soil of their forefathers. And there was a great deal of sympathy for the nuns under the circumstances. The nuns left and they never came back. Uh, years later, the uh, Bunker Hill Monument was erected just in the shadow of the ruins of the convent. The newly arrived um, immigrants in this unfriendly land were overwhelmed with the problem of providing food and shelter for their family. Having little or no money, the immigrant gravitated to the heavily populated areas of the North End and Fort Hill, where his predecessors resided. Here slums developed of such density that they could uh, not be charted on any maps. It took years, sometimes generations, for these desperate people to achieve a decent standard of living. Landlocked Boston had grown during the mid-19th century from its original 780 acres to more than 24,000 acres. We're all familiar with the Back Bay and how these communities were developed over a period of time. So eventually the Irish did move on. By steady annexation, the city grew, uh, now included Roxbury, Dorchester, Charlestown, Brighton, and West Roxbury. Uh, an efficient ferry system also happened, was developed at the time, so that this, the city expanded and the Irish could get out of the slums and, and move out. And many of them eventually, of course, uh, to where we are today, on 128. Okay, now, the no Irish need apply, um, this sign you might be familiar with. The immigrant's ability to provide, to provide shelter for his family was contingent on a course on his wages. The early Irish would take on any job for pay. His only skill was his muscle, 
and the labor be his labor became an important factor in the building of public works and private development in Boston. But without particular skills and subject to the fluctuation of supply and demand, the Irishman was often destitute even when he was working. And um, they had to take the lowest job, developing also canals at that point, and even uh, that area of Massachusetts uh, that we know as the um, building railroads where the mass pike, pike, mass pike is today. But the Greenhorns were um, warned by their clergy to avoid these uh, very dirty and dangerous situations. Uh, the reality of no Irish need apply, however, drove the Irish to accept any position. But what of the Irish girl? A demand for domestic help had existed for some time in affluent Boston families. Local Yankee women regarded such work as beneath them. The Irish Colleen, however, welcomed a, pen, uh, a position that included a clean room and food in addition to the small salary in exchange for her toil in the kitchen and chambers. Although the lengthy work day and meager pay seemed uh, intolerable to us today, the Irish girl felt herself uh, fortunate, many of them. Now, my mother's sisters, Katie Kelly and uh, Annie Kelly, they came out, not out of the closet. She used that expression on They came out from Ireland, and they went to work in the homes of the wealthy, mostly the wealthy Yankees in the Boston area. And I can remember as a child going uh, with my mother, because we had no car, so obviously we got there in public transportation, to Brookline on Chestnut Hill to visit Nellie Kelly. We went in the back door, of course, so she was still working. She was like a retainer in the family. But what I remember most was the azaleas and the rhododendrons, because on Moulton Street in West Lynn, there were no azaleas or rhododendrons. So uh, the Irish girl uh, was a credit to her race. And my mother always emphasized the purity. That was very important. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the Catholicism here, the uh, Holy Cross Cathedral we see here. Even the, the, when this, after the necessities of work and shelter had been met, the Irishman and his family did not easily fit into the community. His Catholicism always got in the way. The tragic history of Aaron, the distrust of novel situations, and the woes that he traced directly back to the Reformation made the newcomer leery of the Yankee establishment, its cultural institutions, and especially its public schools. The reforms of the liberal elite, including abolitionist abolition and women's rights, were thought ridiculous by the uh, reactionary Irishmen. Okay, uh, but many churches were built, as we know, as I said, my great-great-grandfather uh, was one of the founders of St. Mary's, and my own grandfather, and his wife, who died young, were among the fa uh, founders of Sacred Heart in Lynn. Then, here we go, you recognize the height. Who here has any relationship to BC? Does he show hands? Okay, many of you do. Um, the development of the parochial school system in the Archdiocese of Boston is a history in itself. The majority of immigrants sacrificed to provide an education for their children that would protect and develop their faith. The lives of the good nuns who staffed these institutions, so often misunderstood by outsiders, were studies and sacrifice and devotion. And I can say that from personal experience because my own dear sister, Betty, who died a couple of years ago, served as a Notre Dame nun all her life. Realizing the need for Catholic higher education, the Jesuits established a Boston College on Harrison Avenue in the South End in 1863. Tuition, $30 a year. <laughs> Later moved to the Heights, it, BC became the Irishman's Harvard. And I just looked up their acceptance rate today, it's 19%. So I worked in the high school a long time, and when a student was accepted at BC from Linfield High, it was a cause for celebration. It wasn't easy because we're too near to DC. They, they like uh, geographical diversity. Okay, you may recognize this man, William Cardinal O'Connell. 
while the early Irish uh, Catholic Church in Boston was enriched by the presence of many ethnic groups, the predominant flavor of the ecclesiastical hierarchy was distinctly Irish. The uh, son, excuse me, uh, the iron will of Cardinal William O'Connell left an indelible impression on in matters of faith and morals. Now that was an expression that I heard many times over the years, having a Catholic education. Uh, he born into the lace curtain family in Lowell. He apparently um, had in fact first-hand knowledge of the appalling situations of the mills and a, had apparent sympathy with the working class. However, with his exposure to the aristocratic ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical circles in Rome, his uh, sophisticated taste in art and music, and his acceptance into the Brahmin elite upon his assumption of the red hat, Cardinal O'Connell's reign became further and further removed from the um, source of the proletariat, that group that he had uh, been born into. He built quite a palace uh, in the Back Bay, which later became a Notre Dame uh, girls' school, uh, Granby Street. When I went to Emanuel, there were several of these lace curtain Irish from West Roxbury. They uh, attended the Notre Dame Academy at Granby Street, his home. It still stands there. Okay, now we're going to get into more friendly territory. Uh, this is um, his successor, in contrast, Richard Cardinal Cushing, was perceived as a man of the people who never forgot his humble beginnings, even though he mingled comfortably with the powerful in the discharge of his duties. The hospitals, schools, and agencies that he created to meet the needs of the faithful were countless. His vulnerability, his sensibility, had endeared the world's cardinal to the uh, diocese and to the nation until his death in uh, 1970. Now, again, when I went to Emmanuel and the Cardinal would come, which he did uh, periodically, every couple of times a year, and he would address us, my dear young Catholic women, and the nuns would be fluttering off. <laughs> he just loved the Cardinal. He, had to, he was quite extraordinary. Now, this is a relative, supposedly. John Boyle O'Reilly. Uh, no consideration of the Irish community would be complete without mention of the pilot, the weekly paper of Catholic interest since 1829. The paper was for many years uh, the Irish immigrants' only trusted source of information. Its poetry and stories based on the uh, remains, remains of Irish themes comforted their longing to uh, return to the old country. Now, I just have to say from the, the Gallagher perspective, again, my mother couldn't get too much information from the Gallaghers, but they did mention John Boyle O'Reilly, who was very well known. He was a poet, he was a writer, he was, uh, and he also became involved in the uh, Brahmin elect as a writer. But supposedly, uh, there was a relative of the Gallaghers who, whose name was, I figured it out later, was Riley, who went out to the bogs when he was running from the English. He was later in prison and sent to Australia, but she brought food out there. So it was, uh, there was a connection there. And I remember when I first went to the Massachusetts Historical Society, which was rather threatening to a little school teacher, when I walked in, it's a magnificent building. It's all these old Harvard professors and bankers and lawyers. And I heard one old gentleman say, I said to George Bush just the other day, and I thought, wow, how'd I get here? But when I left, I walked out, and there was this statue of John Boyle O'Reilly. My mother was alive at the time. I said, no, don't worry, there's a statue of John Boyle O'Reilly outside. So uh, she really, uh, she was happy with that. If the statue has, has since been moved, they changed the traffic back. With hard work and endurance, the Boston Irish made a slow climb to, out of the ghetto to respectability after the Civil War, a conflict in which the South shed his blood freely for the Union cause. And my father was proud of the fact that his two grandfathers, Patrick Gallagher and Patrick Bowen, or not Lowen, Bowen, 
they um, served in the civil during the Civil War. The employment picture at the hub was bleak because of the families who controlled the local finance preferred to send spend their trust funds, uh, you know, and it, Boston was decaying uh, economically, is what I'm saying. But eventually, things came back. And the Irish found their way with uh, the, the construction business themselves. Then, the Boston Irish soon discovered uh, their road to power, which was politics. Gregarious by nature, enjoying the um, I'll lay here, move it off, anyway. Enjoying the franchise denied them by their forefathers in the old country and possessing wit, charm, and blarney, the Irishman was a natural for the political arena. Hugh <clears throat> O'Brien, elected in uh, 1884, and Patrick Collins, elected in 1902, were the uh, first Irish mayors of Boston. Men of breeding and refinement who were concerned with the control of public spending their tenures were not as threatening as the Yankee had feared, but vic the victory of John Fitzgerald, uh, was another map. Now, I think the girl on the left, who is it? Rose. Rose, I think that's Rose. Isn't that a beautiful family picture? Okay. Yeah, but, and who's waiting in the wings, of course? <clears throat> um, Waiting in the wings, however, we're going to read tomorrow, uh, was a consummate politician who would crush the Yankee establishment and by comparison to Honeybiz appear to be an angel of mercy. James Michael Curley had arrived and Boston would never be the same. He immediately rejected the support of existing Democratic ward bosses and called the Yankee aristocracy, quote, Clubs of female fattest, old gentlemen with disordered livers, or pessimists croaking over the imaginary old days and ignoring the sunlit past. So I'm sure you're familiar with, with his wit and, and charm uh, from the movies that have been made about him and so on. After his election, Curley controlled the whole of the city government from his own desk in a style that was so bizarre and unfathomable that only he could decipher the daily workings of the city hall. The self-taught son of humble parents, a silver-tongued orator of insatiable ambition, and a shameless promoter of his own largesse, young Jim endeared himself to the uh, electorate who cried for vengeance on the Yankee hierarchy or for all past woes, real and imagined. And the Irish were masters of reciting uh, the woes, those that were real and those that, that were imagined. Curly would keep the animosity between the Irishmen and the Puritan going for centuries, excuse me, decades to go. Curly enjoyed four widely scattered terms as mayor. So from 1914 to 1945, interspersed with two terms as congressman and a single term as governor during the height of the Depression. Beaten by Henry Cabot Lodge for the 1936 Senate seat and by Leverett Saltonstall for the governorship in 1938, the lovable Robin Hood of Boston politics, who even survived a five-month jail term for fraud, <laughs> was finally pardoned, uh, finally outdone by his Brahmin foe. So he was the last flamboyant. Irish mayor of Boston, and I do recall, I believe he died around the late 50s, and I happened to be in Boston, I was in college then, with friends, and uh, he was being waked in grand style up at the State House. All right, leaving the city. After World War II, thousands uh, of third and fourth generation Irish disillusioned by the con uh, confines of the city and encouraged by the GI Bill made their flight to the suburbs as did their ethnic counterparts. As we know, that's why most of us have ended up in, in Linfield. We've all flown the city. Old Boston, the once proud seat of merchant princes, was clearly in decline. Fortunately, a core of economists uh, recognized uh, the stability of Boston's financial establishment 
and saw it as the future of counting house for a myriad of uh, technology and engineering firms that had started around 128. In the late uh, 50s, with the city on the verge of bankruptcy, a strong coalition of businessmen, civic leaders, and bankers had joined the vault, the basement uh, boardroom of Ralph Lowell's, the quintessential Yankee, God love him, started Channel uh, 2, I believe. Uh, in his safe deposit um, bank, a plan to hold uh, the uh, urban renewal. So Boston came back in the 50s, that's the bottom line. How many remember the skyline before the Prudential? Anybody mm -hmm. can remember the, the skyline before all of the urban renewal that took place later? With the uh, 20th century now in the rearview mirror, the Boston Irish are a strong but less conspicuous presence in the city today. Several generations of living in America have blurred for them the tragic conditions that made their ancestors flee their native land. But they are quick to take offense at any affront to Ireland or their native heritage. They sport their green on St. Patrick's Day, enjoy melancholy songs of uh, longing to return to their land, and partake of corned beef and cabbage dinners on St. Patrick's Day at home or in a neighboring pub. Now, how many had corned beef and cabbage? Anyway, the last one, okay. So we're keeping up the tradition, great. <laughs> the Irish support several organizations which celebrate their roots, including the local Hibernians. Courses in Irish language, culture, and history are popular in local colleges. Many trace their genealogies back uh, to, uh, for a pleasant trip to Ireland where they come back more Irish than the Irish. <laughs> My father-in-law came back wearing those t-shirts, you know, with the wide, um, um, the tweed cap, the whole bit. And uh, the Irish laughing us over there, but we go anyway. The American Irish feel at home in the old country and re retain an interest in her political situation. Indeed, a sense of sadness and longing has pervaded the existence of Irishmen and greatly enhanced their literary legacy. The skillful manipulation of the language has been Ireland's greatest gift to the world. Now, remember the occasion here. Let us conclude by remembering the Boston Irish Prince JFK and his whirlwind tour of Ireland in June of 1963, shortly before his untimely death. The people of Erin went wild for their native son. The streets of Dublin were thronged with well-wishers amidst the Irish and American banners as the president and his entourage made their official visits to the diplomatic counterparts. Uh, then, this was a, just incredible the way the Irish re received them. Now, can you see the Kennedy or, um, resemblance in that uh, young lady to the left? The focal point of the sojourn, excuse me, the focal point of the sojourn was JFK's triumphant return to his ancestral home in New Ross County, Wexford. There he was greeted by a sea of American flags and a boy singing the choir, the boys of Wexford. Suddenly Kennedy broke away from his bodyguard and joined the choir for the second chorus prompting misty-eyed reaction both from the uh, observers and the press. He was deeply moved by his experience in, during that trip. Then the president enjoyed tea, cake, and homemade sandwich, salmon sandwiches. Now that sounds delicious, it? salmon sandwiches. With his cousin, Mary Ryan, and other members of the um, clan, toasting all those Kennedys who went and all those Kennedys who stayed. Nor did he forget his maternal forebears, the Fitzgeralds, his great-grandfather, Thomas Fitzgerald, left Ireland during the Great Famine, establishing himself as a cooper in Boston. JFK explained, quote, he carried nothing except two things, a strong, religious faith and a strong desire for liberty. 
I am glad to say that all of his grandchildren value that inheritance. And that was his um, observation as he left. On the last day of the visit, President Kennedy received the Freedom of the City Award at Aaron Square in, uh, Aaron Square in Galway City. In describing the strong bonds between Ireland and America, he concluded that if the day were clear enough, and if you went down to the bay and looked west, and your sight was good enough, you could see Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> they went wild. <laughs> because the Irish have so many connections to Boston. The motorcade then headed to um, Shannon Airport, where yet another emotional throng had gathered uh, to bid him farewell. It, uh, later, he later remarked uh, that his staff, his trip, excuse me, his stick to, trip to Ireland was the happiest four days of his life. He just loved the experience. Okay? Then, when JFK's days were cut short by an assassin's bullet, five months later, so again, he went in June and he was uh, assassinated in November 1963. Uh, his widow, Jacqueline Kennedy, made a request of the Irish government that those cadets who had so impressed the president on his visit uh, perform the drill again uh, at his state funeral. So these young men were quite impressed and uh, rather nervous to re uh, repeat this ceremony, but they did so at his funeral. The people of Ireland were devastated by the young president's assassination, yet they would take comfort having welcomed their countrymen home months earlier. When leaving, Kennedy assured his admirers that he and his entourage feel ourselves at home and not in a strange country, Next time. but feel ourselves among neighbors, even though we are separated by generations of time and by thousands of miles. More than a half century later, American visitors still feel the legacy of JSK's uh, visit to Ireland. Uh, the uh, ascendancy of John Fitzgerald Kennedy to the American presidency remains the crowning glory of the story of the Boston Irish. Now, I'm just going to end there with uh, this picture. Now this is um, we have Pablo and left from Bellina Hedwich uh, in Ross Common. And I was happy to have gone there with my cousins who are here tonight, MJ and Brendan, Lowen. Brendan's family lives not far. When I told them that we were going over, and I said, you know, I have, I think Paul Boland uh, was buried in um, Ross Common, and I have his birth certificate. That's all you need. I could even become an Irish citizen. I haven't gone that far yet, but. Uh, this is the church where Pablo was uh, baptized in 1785. When I saw it, I thought, oh, that, that can't be the same church. It's in too good condition. But there was a book that I picked up there which described all of the maintenance over the years to, uh, to the chapel. And uh, it still stands. It was a, just a remarkable uh, experience to trot through the graveyard with all the bowl of graves and uh, the grass was rather high, but we, we did read many of the headstones. So I feel that in that trip, I have been a few times also, that I um, probably didn't go back, but I did. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Bonnie's going to pass the microphone. What I like to do is have people share their own Irish experience if they want. I've, I've talked enough about Lyle. So <laughs> if you wish to... Um, Make a comment or uh, agree, disagree. I hope I haven't offended anyone because I am uh, telling the story as I heard it. I believe you got a lot of pots. <laughs> good. Stop with this. Again, go ahead. We have a raffle. Okay, good. We're going to raffle off a Boston Irish. Uh, oh, really? Book. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, so. Okay. Oh, well, I do You know what? Uh, this is. Carol, she's, she's visiting us today. This is my uh, daughter's mother-in-law. Carol, you can come to the 
anybody have some stories they'd like to share with us or questions for Alan? Quite a few years ago, my parents went over to Ireland. It's a little bit visit. louder, Bob. I don't know if the people can hear. This on? Is this on? Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, quite a few years ago, my parents went over to Ireland. We're right. Scottish, not right. Irish, like I said. <laughs> Same church, different pew. Right. You know, <laughs> Celtic and Celtic. Uh, but they enjoyed it greatly. They went back again. They thought it was a great place. Mm -hmm. They were there, and one of the things, and some of the people said, Oh, sure, are you coming down to the pub tonight for the sing-along? So they did. Right. They had a great time there. But again, uh, a lot of my friends, especially in the fire department, we have a picture of all the Max and Mix. <laughs> <laughs> the McGonald's, the McDonald's, the McKendricks, and so <laughs> forth. You know, so. All brothers under the skin. Yes, Definitely. yes. Uh, hands across the water and all that. Yes. We ended up in, a, in Northern Ireland once with a dear friend singing that with some people from Ulster. <laughs> Anyone else want to share or ask a question? Okay, that's it. Well, you've been a wonderful class, so I'm saying you all have a that. Okay, everybody's invited to stay for refreshments. We've got some non-alcoholic Guinness there, and we're going to have some music, too. So, thanks, everybody, for coming. And is it? Sancho. Sancho. Mm -hmm.